Um, know this, there is much that I'm skipping over, but um, I understand after two semesters, Don had gotten to chapter six or something, so. Oh, well, he told me different. We always called it hysterical books. Okay, we're going to do John chapter 5. <clears throat> and we'll take it to... piece by piece here. Let's uh, read uh, verse 1 through 9. As we read, I want you to notice things. Because things put together in a certain order make circumstances. And circumstances is what trips us up. But if we see through the circumstances to the spiritual reality, we become able to move with the Lord instead of tripped up by things arranged in certain orders. So, if you can, try to notice some particularly things that you think might be important. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. <clears throat> Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made well <clears throat> of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd been there thus now a long time, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made well? The impotent man answered, Sir, answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise. Take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man ma was made well and took up his bed and walked. And the same day was the Sabbath. <clears throat> okay, without writing them on the board, what are some things that we see in this story? Elin? Pool? Okay. I guess it's so hot we noticed that pool first. There was a, there was a pool. <laughs> Ricky? Sheep gate. Okay. Somebody else? Uh huh. Feast? Okay. Uh, Greg? Okay. Okay. Diseased, sick people? Kelly, is that what you noticed? Okay. Elin? Angel? Troubled waters? Like a bridge of... Mike? Jerusalem? <coughs> uh-huh. Okay, impotent man, uh, that's, that's probably maybe one of the most important things there. Elaine? It's on the Sabbath. Very good. Um, one of the things that I keep noticing over and over and over, and it's almost regardless of where I read, that God continually initiates and I'm really you know I mean I know that I know that I know the truths of grace I know but I am um, I think I'm learning something more in relationship to how he is and how he operates um, Imagine, if you will, being me and reading over and over and over. I mean, from, from Genesis to Revelation, I keep running in these places where either people have messed up or people don't even know God or, or people are unable to help themselves and weren't looking for Jesus. And 
the Lord appears or the Lord shows up and he begins to take an action that brings them, you know, that really makes their name great. They were nothing, unheard of before God showed up, but God showed up. And in most of the cases I'm seeing, they weren't particularly even seeking the Lord. And in many of the cases, they didn't even know of that particular God. And, but, but that the Lord um, initiates, the, and the key there that I'm trying to get across is that God, that, that they didn't, uh, well, let's put it this way. If, if you mess up real bad or whatever, are you one of those that automatically thinks that you're totally separated from God, that God isn't even interested in you as long as you've, you've sinned or messed up, that you're going to have to begin a process now of works and of actions that show that you really do love God even though you messed up, it's going to begin to move you and position you back into a place where God can receive you, love you, and accept you again. Is there, you don't have to raise your hand, but is there anybody here like that? <clears throat> Mostly I got head shaking no, which is, which is good. Which is good. Because that gives me the assurance that, never mind. <clears throat> And I need that assurance so that, you know, never mind. <laughs> well, um, this story, and it's not just a story, by the way. It, it is an actual event. It wasn't a parable. Jesus said there was a certain man. And... Uh, this story is premised on the fact that this man was impotent, meaning there was, he had no ability in himself. No ability. I think you, you find this disparagement between really talented people who sing or who do you know, have administrative skills or whatever, and they work for God, and you see success. And on the other hand, on the other extreme, you have people that are, just have no ability and power, and God moves in their life. And then you have this very wide thing between those two of people who are not overly abundantly talented and blessed, nor are they to a degree that they recognize their own weakness the way God would like it, who are fooling around mixing law and grace constantly. Just this big gap, which includes a lot of people who don't really understand what God their Father is like, though they know that He is their Father because the Word says mainly because they don't know it by experience. They don't know what a father is, and they don't know what the father is by experience. And they've never learned to trust him as a father. And by the way, the story just before this one, which the chapter breakups were not originally there, the story just before this is in relationship to a father and his son and what that's all about. Um, just... Uh, don't not not really realizing I mean we call him father but not really realizing and therefore relating is that good not realizing and therefore relating to him as father so that we trust him as God but we don't trust him as father meaning okay well I trust you God but that's different you know what I mean? That's like, we trust you, old great law keeper and maker who will zap me if I'm wrong. That's a lot different than trusting, trusting your father and especially trusting the father. How does a person know the father? Well, the way they know him, you would say, is by having a great family life and a great father that taught you and da-da-da-da and all this. And, you know, in this society... Um, 
there isn't such a thing doesn't seem to be anymore you know uh, so the only way is by the Holy Spirit to teach you what he's really like <clears throat> another way is by searching the scriptures and, and seeing things you know seeing how like he appears and no, nobody did anything or Adam and Eve fail and God shows up and fixes the whole thing and covers them and you know and they don't deserve anything you know, they deserve, you know, I, I was, I'll tell you an interesting one I was thinking about today. It really blew my mind as I thought about it. <clears throat> Moses goes up, he gets the, the law, the Ten Commandments, or the covenant. He, he makes a covenant with God. He comes down, they've already broke the covenant. I mean, he hadn't even got down yet, and he, they've broken the covenant. So... He throws the tables of stone down, Moses does, and it breaks to show that the law is broken. Okay. I mean, the law is this. Uh, you do this, and you'll be blessed. You do this, and you'll be cursed. You didn't do this. You people should be cursed. I made a covenant with you. You broke it within the first hour. It's over with. You're out of here. I'm out of here. That's it. No, that's, that's most people's view of God. You know what he does? He turns around and reestablishes the covenant. I was just going, whoa! You know, we just go, you know, or if we see that, we go, well, yeah, he just said, okay, I forgive you. But, you know, and God can't do that. He can't just go, I forgive you. I act like you didn't do nothing wrong. Because he can't do that. So what he does is he adds something that he didn't add the first time. It's a series of rituals that involve sacrifice that take care of all the failures so that he can continue to relate to them. <laughs> I'm just going, man. You know, I mean, if he was God the way most of us think he's God, he should have wiped them all out and just found him a whole new group. But instead he turns right around and he says, okay, you can't make it. So what you need is something called a lamb. And through this lamb, we're going to be able to stay in relationship together. But the main thing is, is that you have to acknowledge that death continually and that relationship based on that. And if you do that, man, we're tied. And, you know, Israel, at times they got away from the sacrifices. They worshipped other gods. And, yeah, I mean, it's bad enough to worship other gods. But when you get away from the sacrifice, you're cutting your own throat. You know, and then, then everybody wonders why God gets mad, you know. God didn't get mad. You cut your own throat. Uh, most of this coming on you is, is um, I want my way, and I, you know, don't particularly want to go this way, you know. And the neat thing about God is, is that he will correct you because he's a good father, but he will not make you, and there is a difference. <clears throat> so you have this basic picture here of an impotent man who wasn't even looking, praying, or seeking for, for, for Jesus. And the whole situation arises around that. Um, it says that uh, around this pool lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, of lame, of halt, or paralyzed. And have you ever noticed the people that Jesus usually shows up to help? You know, that's why if, if if you're wise, you know, I mean, I, I'll never forget the time that the Holy Spirit showed me that he has made foolish the wisdom of the wise. And I realized what he was saying. He didn't make foolish the wisdom of the sinner, you know, or the really wicked person, but the wise. And I went, oh, oh. And he has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise because they will not trust in themselves or look to their own strength or you know but they will they have to in this sense but because they recognize really if you will put it that way because they recognize their weakness they're able to respond to it and um, uh, you John uh, what is it no Luke 15 kind of starts the same way I mean this chapter starts with this Luke 15 starts and he says then drew near unto him all the outcasts and the sinners and the prostitutes and everything 
to hear his word. And the Pharisees said, what is this? If Jesus was really something special, he would not hang out with people like this. And Jesus said, let me tell you a few little parables here. And he proceeded to explain that if, you, if you're well, you don't need a doctor. And he came as a physician to help people. And, uh, you know, if you're walking around saying, I'm well, when you're sick, you won't go to him. But if you go, I'm sick, I need you, Lord, then he, he, he's there, you know. And it's funny that they were all at this place. This wasn't even a... Um, a healing conference, you know. This wasn't this wasn't a, a you know a situation where Jesus was being lifted up. He went to where they were at. It's also interesting to note that he didn't heal them all. Anybody ever wonder about that? I mean, it says a great multitude, and he walks in there and heals one guy. Nobody ever thought about that? I mean, I've, I've looked at that and gone, what is the deal, man? I mean, there's a great multitude, and all it says is he went in there and found this one guy, talked to him, healed him, and that was it. Do you know that it's possible to be lame or blind or halt and to be full of pride and full of uh, yourself or full of... Uh, uh, an attitude is possible. It's possible. So it, that does not necessarily mean that you're going to be open to the Lord. I believe it is the recognition of your need. You don't have to have, you know, an arm gone and an eye missing and all this to find Jesus in his fullness. You just have to recognize your need. The, the, uh, Jesus wrote to the church of the Laodiceans and he says, you know, your problem is, is that you're blind and you're naked and you're, you know, really messed up. And he says, that's not your problem. Your problem is you don't know it. You think that you're rich and increased with goods and that you're doing real good. Do you see the difference is, is that to come to a recognition of your need for the Lord to whatever degree that you come to that recognition is the degree that you will find that the ability to lay hold of the Lord. And if you are always seeking to get out of situations that show your need, you're stretching your time, you're stretching your distance as far as how long it'll take you to get to the Lord. As long as you're avoiding situations the, the, the deal isn't to put yourself in situations so you suffer. The deal is God, it really is God. And he will come for those that will, if you understand my terminology, he will come for those that look to him. So the real danger would be, uh, you know, I mean, you can say, okay, here's the bad situation, and here's me. And I don't want to put myself into this because I don't like how it feels or I don't like this or I don't like that or I don't whatever. But in reality, whatever this is showing, it may be showing that th these, these people or this p job or whatever is a bad situation. It may show that. But for you to not be able to handle it by Christ shows that you have a need. It should. It should. But if we avoid that, and we prolong or basically, you know, and there's different ways to avoid it. You can pray it away. You can do whatever. But the idea is not put yourself in there and just suffer. That's not the idea. That's wrong. As if by suffering, this, this makes you extra special. That's not it. Or just putting yourself in that situation and, um, you know, that, that there's some sort of virtue of putting yourself in a bad situation. That's not right. That's not right. I can't think of what else we would think. Uh, but I can tell you 
that to put yourself in here and to find that you are unable to handle it and then to respond with, Oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. I cannot. I cannot. I am unable. I am too weak. And I recognize it. A lot of times we don't, we're not able to be, we're not impotent. We're not able to be helped by the great physician because we're too busy seeing what's wrong with the situation. Amen. We're too busy seeing what's wrong with the situation, which, which in a certain sense waters down the reality of what's wrong with us. It waters it down so that we go, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, so, you know, it's wrong. Okay. But God didn't put you in there just to be critical or... But, uh, and then there's the other side of it. We think God put us in there to straighten this out and this out and this out. That's what we're there for. God has... God's going to use His faithful good servant who is able to identify good and evil. Which happened to be the knowledge taken when man sinned. You know. And... Um, so, through many, many different ways, we are cheating ourselves, first of all. We cheat ourselves. But there is, there is that ability to be put in there, or maybe not even be put in there, but to volunteer because the Lord has led you there. Now, that's another side. Um, I remember when I was... Uh, not yet graduated from Bible school, and I had announced that my wife and I, when we graduated from Bible school, we were going to be married. Not She wasn't my wife at the time, but we were going to be married. And, and so the leaders came to me shortly after that. And um, they said, uh, well, Randy, we understand that, you know, you graduate, then you're going to get married. And, you know, well, we've been praying about it, and as the leaders, we'd we, uh, like for you to consider going to the mission field taking your new wife, you'll be there and soon, as soon as we can get you there. Just get married and we'll send you. And my first response was, oh, no, no, no. I can't, I can't handle it. I'm not, I'm not wise enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not able. I'm, all my weaknesses started coming to the forefront. I, I can't do that. I mean, I, I'm barely out of Bible school. I you know, um, and um, so I went before the Lord, and I saw that the Lord, the Lord actually uses sometimes. There's there's a few rare cases where God can actually use leaders. Every once in a while, that happens, and he and he you, he was trying to use those leaders to lead me, but it was him leading me. It was his will. It was his will for my life. I could read that any number of ways. I can't go. I'm not good enough, strong enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not able. I'm not da 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 da. Whatever. You know, I'd like to, you know, the Bible says in the Old Testament, let a man enjoy his wife for a good year. I don't even get that. So, you know, any number of things that you could think of. But it was God's will, and God was leading me there by somebody that was over me that actually came up with an idea that said, we feel this. Now, now, obviously, I have the option to check it out, and if I don't feel like it's the will of God, I should follow what I feel is the will of God. Amen? I mean, I'm not... What I'm not trying to... What I am not at all trying to declare here is the place of authority in somebody's life. That's not even my point. So if you're already off on that, that's not... But, I'm, but I, what I am trying to share, share is that sometimes God leads you into places. And sometimes, and I didn't know, I would never, I would never on my, out of my own mind pick Jamaica, pick being a missionary. I mean, my plans were totally in another direction. I was not thinking mission field right out of Bible school. I can guarantee that none of those thoughts were in my mind. If it hadn't have been for some leaders here, I wouldn't have been able to hear from God, but I'm not talking about leadership. Whatever method God uses, 
sometimes he leads you by you know he says go do that and sometimes the Lord speaks and says you know this is it through leadership or your husband or wife or somebody else and you know that that's the will of God and you say no okay well you know what God works by authority not by power he says that's fine he doesn't throw a fit he don't get mad at you he doesn't love you less he does not love you less he is love how can he be any less than what he is but you don't know him yet because he is love but when you know him you'll go how you'll say to somebody else how can he be any less than what he is he is love when you know him you see what I mean and that, that time's coming so so we you know here's the pool and here's oh, I don't want to be hanging around with them I don't want to be seen as impotent I don't want you know what I mean Jesus comes walking through there and you miss Jesus you know could that happen yeah Pro does it probably happen to Christians yeah it probably happens has it probably ever happened to anybody at new creation yeah it's, it's probably happened to people at new creation has it maybe happened within the last month I'm, I would say yes I would say maybe even closer than the last month okay well you know what like I said his love is not diminished he loves you but we're not talking about love well, not from his side. We're not talking about love from his side because he's he doesn't change. It doesn't phase him. He doesn't. He's going to be. And and I saw this in a historical perspective one time when the Holy Spirit took me. I almost I don't know how to put it, but like showed me how God was faithful to his plan and even when Israel got way off and went way way off and everything eventually he he worked and he did this and he set that up and finally got them back around you know what I mean I mean we're talking long suffering through generations okay so I've learned that God really is faithful and true and he really man he means it when he says that if God be for us, who can be against us? The biggest thing is neither height nor depth nor principality. The, the only thing that can be against us is us because he will not override us. He can override the devil. He can override your financial situation. He can, but he can't override your will. He, he, he can, but he won't because then that would make him of the other kingdom and that would turn the light out in the universe and the whole thing would be plunged into darkness so he won't okay so you know I mean if a person walks up to the, the the land of promise and doesn't believe that and sees things that you know I don't know man I mean to go this way you know there's giants there's things that I'm I would face if I go this way that I wouldn't have to face if I don't. I'm not stupid. Oh, you're not? I'm not stupid. I will not be led, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. How do you think? The Lord is my shepherd. How do you think you got in the valley of the shadow of death? You didn't just walk in there. You were led in there. You were led in there. You're led every step of the way. Believe it or not, all things work together for good to them that love God. Those are called according to his purpose. Not just those that love God, but those are called according to his purpose. And what is his purpose? The very next verse says that we might be conformed to the image of his son. He's not saying, you know, it's all going to work out as long as you keep voiding out my plan in your life. He says it's all working out for that plan as long as you're working with me in that plan. Okay, now what happens if you get in here and you really can't handle it because you're not spiritual enough or you're not plugging into the Lord the way you should or whatever? Well, what happens? Is it all, you know, some, somebody, what happens? Grace, okay, in what, in what form might grace be given in a situation like that? There's probably several different forms. Kelly?
Okay, so he might, are you saying maybe he could remove you for a while, if necessary? And that would be grace. But, but by whose hand would you be removed? Yeah. And that's important, don't you think? I would think that's important. Okay, he, he, could, he could deliver you by dealing with the situation, but he's going to raise up another one. You know what I mean? Those temporal things that we think that there's only about, about 25 or 30 in a lifetime, that if God will just remedy them all, then life will be wonderful. I'm, I'm sorry. That's not at all the deal. He's got 87 billion of those. <laughs> And you cannot exhaust them all. You can only systematically reject them one by one by one instead of going, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm going where he wants me to go. And, uh, okay, I'm in this situation. Now, Lord, it's real important to me that I know why I'm here and what is your purpose here. And because, number one, if we're going to talk about my flesh, which I didn't identify with, because had I identified with it, I wouldn't have allowed you to put me in this situation. Is that right? I mean, my flesh said, no, I don't want that. But I chose not to identify with my flesh. I said, okay, my flesh still doesn't want it, but I'm not identifying with it. I'm here for you. I want you to be my shepherd. I want you to be my Lord. You know, I don't want to just call you Lord. Lord, Lord, why call Jesus? Why well, call you my Lord, Lord, and do not things that I tell you. Call me Savior. See, he doesn't even mince that. He saved you. Just call me Savior. But don't, don't be a hypocrite in the thing. Don't call me Lord. Okay? <laughs> so that's not bad. He's not evil if he says that. He's just saying, unless your words match up with your living. You know, call me shepherd. You know, well, the Lord is my Savior. You know, a lot of us could almost reduce it down to one relationship. The Lord is my Savior. I shall not go to hell. You know what I mean? But is he your shepherd? And if he is your shepherd, that means something. It means something specific, and it's a specific relationship with Jesus. Do you agree with that? A specific relationship with Jesus as shepherd which denotes his leading wherever. Right? And that's why he didn't just say, Jesus is my shepherd, but he did say, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. Because, you know, you can have a shepherd not do what he says or go where he wants. He's shepherd by title, but he ain't Lord because Lord isn't just a title. It's not really meant to be a title. It's meant to be a relationship. Okay. So, but, but in this situation, there wasn't even a knowing of what was going on. This man was just one among many. But I noticed a couple of things. Let's see. Let me, let me read some notes here. Had healing been the main goal, plan, and purpose of Jesus, he would have healed all these people. You know, Jesus has got a plan. He's got a primary plan, and then he heals, and he does a lot of other things as he's trying to carry out that plan. If healing were that plan, he'd have just healed everybody there because that's his plan. Okay. People who don't believe in healing say, well, if you can heal, why don't you go in the hospital and heal them all? I've had people tell me that because I do believe in healing. Um, you know, well, if Jesus can heal, you know, if you guys believe in healing, why don't you go down there in the hospital and heal everybody? But Jesus didn't walk in this situation and heal everybody. You know, because I may believe in healing, but I don't believe that's his primary purpose. I believe that if healing serves that purpose to be conformed to the image of his son, he will heal you. And if, like Jacob, he needs to knock his hip out so he gets his attention, he'll do that. He'll do whatever he has to do because he knows that flesh is just flesh and, you know, 
what he can accomplish in us is more important than what he can accomplish in us. He ever works to overcome those things because that's the way he is. But this scripture is not just a rebuke to those who don't believe in healing, but a rebuke to those who think that one of the main purposes of Jesus is to heal everybody, because it's not. But he, have you ever been in a service where, let's say that you were feeling bad, and then somebody called everybody up to get prayed for, and somebody, you know, got healed, and the next person got healed, the next person got healed, you got prayed for and didn't get healed, and then the next person got healed, and you went back and went, what's the deal? You know, you wonder, what's going on? What's going on? He may be dealing with you a different way because you are a specific son, you know. Your name is Carrie, not, you know, Roger or whatever. You know, so specific dealing to bring you to that fullness of his plan that he... And this is where he gets all things work together for good. And then Paul viewed it like this. We don't. But Paul viewed it like this. This light affliction worketh for us. For us. For God is for us, by the way. Worketh for us a far more and exceeding weight of glory while we look not at the things which are saying no 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 giants in the land I ain't going in a far more exceeding weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen which we would call maybe the sense realm or circumstances or things put in a certain order but we look at the things which are not seen or the things which are eternal for though our outward man perish, what is your outward man? You have an outward man, an inward man. The inward man is the spirit man connected, your spirit connected to the Holy Spirit and to Christ. And the outward man is your soul and your body, from which you have your five senses and you make contact with this world. And <clears throat> your outward man is not perishing in that it's getting older. That's not what he meant there. Yeah, have you ever wondered about your, though day by day, your outward man perishes, but your inward man is renewed day by day? He's not talking about the fact that you're getting older and it's perishing and you're just getting old. He's talking about a lessening of going by those senses. There is, a, there is a work of God going on in your life daily. Does that sound good? <clears throat> a work of God day by day. Now, see, he, de he doesn't, you know, you've heard me talk about this, but we mark our life down to da-da-da-da. Well, of course, here's the big milestone, and then, well, here's another thing after many years, and da 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 Oh, I remember the time, da 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 And then we give our testimony, and we talk about the three big milestones. But God doesn't work that way. He works day by 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 day, and then an accruing of the fullness of that begins to manifest. We call those milestones, but those are only manifestations. That's all they are. They're only manifestations. They're not really what we think. They, they were going to happen because there was a flow with the Lord. You didn't earn it. You just, you know, it's kind of like getting in the river and floating down and going, whoa, I did it, man, I did it. You know, well, no, the river did it, you know. You know, you just got in it and floated down. says there was a certain man this this certain man seemed to have an infirmity and it says a certain period of time it says uh, 38 years 38 years but what I got out of that is that he had an infirmity not 38 years oh my goodness you know that's a long time you know uh, oh, that's almost 40 years in the wilderness my god I'm sure I'm going to be one of them that'll wander 40 years this proves it but rather, it signifies a certain period of time. A certain period of time. A certain period of time. Timing is important. Timing is very important. It's real important. 
or I wrote down, time in this world helps you realize how futile this realm is. In other words, by attempting to draw strength from things of this realm and this world and everything, you find out how really futile it is. And then you begin to go, this is stupid. I'm looking to the Lord next time. I've been around this road plenty of times. You know, I thought, I thought drugs would do it. I thought this would do it. I thought that would do it. I thought this would satisfy. And I tried all those things. And I'm really, the longer I go, the more I see this is really futile. Vanity of vanities. I'm going after the Lord. You know what I mean? Time, time can work that with you if you're kind of paying attention. You know, now there are some people, and I know it, but there are some people that it's kind of like they get in a situation and it slaps them, and then they walk right back into the same exact situation that slaps them, slaps them, and they never go, uh, okay. And, you know, I mean, we would say, boy, I'm really dumb. I'll never walk into that situation again. I think there's a better way. Lord, help me to understand what's going on here. If, it is, if I need to hear from you, don't walk in that situation, fine. I will do it because I am, you are my Lord and I am submitted unto you. But I will not do it going, boy, am I stupid. That hurts my flesh every time and I will protect my flesh regardless of any, no, I won't even consider asking God. Is that, is, does that make any sense? I mean, do you end up with the same action? One says, I'm tired of getting slapped. I ain't walking in that situation anymore. And you got the same result. The other one goes, you know, Lord, you're my Lord, and help me, you know, if, help me to see what the deal is. And he says, well, this is really a futile direction you're taking here, and it's resulting in this. I don't want you to go in that situation anymore. Then you're nothing more than an obedient sheep of the, of the Lord, of the good shepherd, or of your father you see what I mean but the other way is well you know I did the right thing I know I did the right thing I'm getting tired of slapping I ain't going in the situation anymore bless God I you know well I don't know I just you know I just want to know the Lord and I want you know I think that if he's going to be called Lord then then I want as much as I can to bring you know, it talks about that. Bring those things. You know, it's, it's not like, well, I'm some sort of slave here. Okay, put me in that situation. That's a slave mentality. I, I've been studying in Galatians a little bit, and I've been studying in relationship to, to the law a little more, and I really, the Lord's helped me to understand a few things about, about this place, uh, about the uh, tutors and governors that it talks about in Galatians chapter 4. And I think I understand some things now. Why? Because there's, because the, the plan that God has set up according to Galatians 4 is right. And we have set up according to that plan. But I've wondered why the results haven't been the same as Galatians 4 as much as I would have thought. And I began to see that the plan is absolutely correct. That to be... To, to look at that is to be placed under tutors and governors, the elements of the world. So we really got a very similar situation that I just drew up here. We'll call this the child. And it says in Galatians, now I say that the heir, he's an heir, but he's a child, immature. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is immature or in emphasis in his understanding, differs nothing from a servant. God didn't make him a servant in that sense. He differs nothing in his attitude than a servant, though he, though he is Lord of all. All is his. Okay? But God the Father has put him under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. The Father, okay? So we always, hey, we're under tutors and governors until, bless God, my flesh don't like it anymore. We're not under the direction of the Father. We pick and choose, and we, 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 the, there, is, there is no weakness with God's plan. The weakness lies with our flesh. Folks, there's no weakness with the law. Get ready. The law is not from the devil. We made the law weak through our flesh. And I, I, you know, I've been enjoying going through the scriptures, and I've found time after time that Paul really doesn't attack the law. He, he attacks how... 
they approached it. But he says, hey man, the law is given of God. It was, it was ordained of God. Is the law against the promise of God? No, in no ways. So what happens? Because he, he likens tutors and governors to the law. He puts us under tutors and governors. We get put in that situation. And you have a choice of two responses. <clears throat> One is you get in that situation and all of these things come at you, these problems, trials, they come at you. <clears throat> and if you are desirous of the Father's will, if you truly want His will, because you recognize you are His child and He put you in this situation, then you begin to, to uh, respond with, as these things hit you, and this is what the law does, the law begins to show your sin, by the way. And it's part of the plan. The law begins to show your sin. So these rules or this structure, you know, all those bad, horrible words, rules, structure, all those wicked things begin to bring up things in you. Amen on that one? They begin to bring up things in you. Okay, now here's where the path diverges. Either goes to the Father or goes our way. We have a choice at that moment, and that choice is based not on a mental choice, but a heart choice. It's based on a heart choice. A person whose heart has turned to the Lord, the veil is about to be rent because he sees these things, they bring up his inability, his failures, and instead of self-protecting by, and this is what happens every time, you either, you either, there's only one or two things that come out of this, folks. Either it is, oh, wretched place that I'm at, or oh, wretched man that I am. And that's just a fact. You can slice it any way you want to. I know this from the Holy Spirit fresh, and I've known it for a long time, but I know this fresh. It is by, based on our heart. You know, the pure in heart will see God. You'll see God. If you seek Him with all your heart, you'll see God. There is not a person that ever has to worry. But we worry because we know that there are things in our hearts. That's why we worry. That is. That's why we worry. There are things in our heart. There's wickedness in our heart. There is wickedness in our hearts. And the question really with the Lord, because He knows the wickedness. <laughs> he doesn't have to have it manifested in you for Him to know it. He knows the depths that it will go, whether it ever gets an opportunity to manifest. He knows the depths. He does. So he's not shocked, but we make a decision when we're in this situation. Will we recognize what the real issue is, is my attitude towards this person and my refusal to go along with this situation and my... Uh, backbiting or murmuring or tearing down somebody over here in this situation and undermining what's going on there and my whatever and all of the little tricks that are nothing more than from another kingdom all the little tricks that are not of God that aren't from his kingdom and we choose those methods because our hearts we have chosen our heart our heart has chosen a path that it wants okay now, everybody goes into this situation as wretched as anybody else, okay? The, the neat thing about this deal is there's none righteous, no, not one. I mean, the really cool, when you really understand it, is, hey, man, 
There ain't no higher or lower. There ain't no better or worse. In this situation, we all have the same nature from which we draw, and some let it manifest more, but that we, you have the same nature so that if you judge, you know, it says over there in... I'm, boy, I tell you what, I just, I just got all kind of stuff. It says over there in, in Romans uh, chapter 2, he says, um, Who art thou, O man? Thou art inexcusable, who judges another and doeth the same thing. He's not talking about not judging. His issue is not judging. He's talking to people who are judging and others, but they've got the same junk on the inside of them. That's what he's talking. He's not saying you can't judge. He's not. I can prove it and will when we get back into Romans someday. But uh, he's not. There's no, I mean, uh, you can read the context. The context is clear without any great explanation. But... Romans is a process of trying to bring everybody to a point that all have sinned, all have come short of the glory of God, all that enter in here have, but the question is, which road will we take? Mean, some, meanwhile, excusing and justifying. It, it talks about that. They excuse, they justify, they compare. And Paul talks about all these different things in different places. They compare themselves with others, not knowing that there are no comparisons in that sense. All have that same nature. All are condemned because of the nature of Adam. That is your condemnation. And it is that nature that's produced any sins you've sinned or you've sinned or you've sinned or you've sinned or you've sinned. But ultimately a person goes to hell not because of their sins but because of the nature. If you didn't know that, well, we will have to get into Romans, but that's just a fact. But your sins are a manifestation that you got that nature and your death because... You know, so, so all are the same when they get in here, but they don't realize it. It is to the depth that each person realizes their union with Adam or the extent of the wickedness of that nature in them so that you come to a place that Paul calls Romans 7 where you say, Oh, wretched man that I am who becomes a who because there is no hope in you who there's no hope in you but as long as you got hope you know what you get in here and I'm better than this I don't deserve this I I'm telling you and you know what that is the that is as wicked as it can come I know you don't know that but I'm just telling you that it is you think as wicked as it comes as you know, cutting somebody's chest open while they're tied to a post and feeding them their own intestines while they die. That's, no, that's not. That's not. Because that is a wicked act. But what you are doing is covering over and working against God, even though, you know, deep down you love God. You know, I was, I was, uh, I was thinking today as, as I was driving, I was thinking, you know, Lord, I really don't want to sin against you. And then I thought, well, you know, I guess that's really not right. I mean, because if I really, really didn't want to, I wouldn't. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm, you know, maybe you're not. I just thought, you know, if I really, really, really wanted to on a lot of fronts, I just wouldn't. And I think on, uh, and maybe that's more true of me than you because I, I don't think the old nature is pulling me. I think I've seen my death with Christ and, him, and with Christ and union with him. So I think it's even more true of me maybe than some of you here that I, if, that I don't have to sin. But I thought, you know, man, maybe I just better ought to face this and say I don't like to sin against you because I do love you. I don't like sinning against you. I don't like knowing that it's going against what you want. But I don't know that I can say I don't want to. And here's why, how I finally came to this conclusion after sitting in counseling session after counseling session with people say that I don't want to and going, you know, something inside of me after several years screams out, don't say you don't want to because you wouldn't be doing this if you didn't want to. You know, there's something in there that says I want to. <laughs> Come on. You know, there's something in there that says, I, I, I want to. So you go, okay, well, I don't like to. And some people can't even say, I don't like to. 
<laughs> I, I really like it, you know. But we're not, you know. But I'm not talking about I, li I don't like going against God, my Father. I don't like, I don't like it. It, I, it bugs me. That's called guilt. You know what I mean? That's called guilt. It bugs me. <laughs> you know? So, we, 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 I, I feel, and this is just me, and I'm just trying to share some things that I've been mulling over, but I feel that we justify ourselves by saying, well, I don't want to sin, but man, every time I get in that situation, I'll see you, <laughs> or whatever, you know. It is one of many, many, many forms that will not accept our responsibility and our debt and our... And let me tell you, here's one reason why. We think that if we accept it, then we, 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 we're going to go to hell or we're going to be separated from God forever because we're going to see that we're so wretched that God will have nothing to do with us. The neat thing is in this process is when you see your wretchedness and go, who? The next chapter is Romans 8 and you enter into a whole new relationship with God through Christ. Because he died for the ungodly. You know what I mean? I mean, it's really cool how this thing works, but... We don't, we've been taught wrong or something. I don't know. We've been taught, oh, the closer I get to seeing, to, if I let these walls down here that accept my wretchedness and don't blame somebody else, then I will just become uh, hopeless. And the only hope will be the door of faith. You know, and we'd never say this because we don't really know this, but we'd, you could say, and the only hope would be the door of faith whereby I'd identify with Christ and he'd be my righteousness. And from then on, I would never look to self anymore and I would really know that my righteousness, my acceptance and everything is based on God. But I can't let down these things. I've got to hold them and blame and point fingers and justify here and think that this is better. And no, oh, I, I, I couldn't really get to a place where I could actually see Jesus. Let me tell you, the law is until Christ. Now it's going to condemn you and it's going to tear you down and it's going to point out and it's going to be, this Bible is going to be like Pharisees that point to you. Oh, you've done this and you've done that until you see Christ. And then it's going to be like a brand new book because there you're going to see Jesus and you're, you're going to be identified in Him and when they point at you, you're going to go, hey man, you're right, that dude is bad, but I think uh, God said he died on the cross and now I'm in Christ. And if you want to talk about acceptance, my acceptance is based on deeds, the deeds of Christ when he died on that cross. I don't deserve that. I'll never deserve it. And I don't think, because I've seen the depth of this thing, I don't think for one minute, nor will I ever be deceived by flatteries or fooling or anything else, because I know that I don't. So, I'm in Him. That's where my faith will rest. And if, it, if I stand before God and it pans out not to be true, hey, man, the only other course was to do my best down here, and I already saw the depths of me, and I wouldn't have been able to, you know what I mean? If you can forget it. So, this is, this is my only hope. If it ain't right, I didn't have any hope. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? That's right. I didn't have anything to begin with, so I mean, this is this sounded good to me. This cross stuff, you know. And if it ain't true, then I didn't. I well, I can't stand there and go, oh darn! Well, I should have. I already know the answer to the oh, I should have avenue. I wouldn't have. <laughs> I should have, but I wouldn't have. You know. So you know, but that's that's. That's, way, that's down there when you die. This man was impotent. He said, and, and that's the thing, I said uh, it, it was this, this certain man seemed to have an infirmity a certain period of time. Uh, people must see their need. In other words, sometimes it takes time to see your need. Sometimes it takes time. 
Have you ever been in a situation where you were put in this situation and you ran out? You said no. Okay? That was it, right? God didn't care anymore, and nor would he ever bring you back around to this again because you failed, right? Wrong. But you know, sooner or later, it really is. Your guilt for every time you ever ran out of here when it wasn't God's will should be taken care of by the blood of the Lamb, and you should appeal to that and ask God to forgive you and forget it and put it behind you, but that's not all you should do. You should say, Lord, work in me to such a degree that I can go with you through this valley and I can go here and I won't run out and claim I'm my own independent self and I'm my own Savior. I'm saving myself. I'm out of here. Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. You know? But let me tell you, you can't even talk to God right if you're carrying out around the guilt of every time you fail. Do you understand that? You can't even, you'll never come to a pure heart in the sense, I don't mean a perfect heart, it's a pure heart. You can't do it because you carry around all the guilt of every time and so when somebody brings it up, it's like a slap in the face. So it's like, by the way, I just look. I have no idea who I'm looking at or whatever. So <laughs> I was reminded recently that I do that and so anytime I go, you know what, the Lord, I have no idea. Most of the time I don't remember who I was looking at. I remember what I said but not who. So, you know, if you're ever sitting there going, oh, my God, how did he know? Or why is he putting that on me? I don't, or what? I don't know. But sometimes we take it, you know, it's like a slap in the face. And here's why, because we truly, we haven't dealt with it each time because we bear a lot of guilt. The best thing to do is get the guilt off and get, and, and if you took yourself out of here, then say, God, you're my Lord, you're my shepherd. And I really do want to relate to you, right? And I want to learn the lessons that you've got. And I don't want to always, I don't want to be my own savior. I don't want to be the Lord of my life. I don't want to be my own shepherd. I want you to be, and I really believe that you'll do that. But you've got to really believe that he will. You know what I mean? I mean, it really does come, take some faith. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack is a pretty powerful statement. It's not some little meaningless, you know what I mean? I shall not lack. Woo, you better know who you're plugging into. Because if you say that, you know, thinking you do, you're going you're gonna to be doubting. Let me finish this off and then we'll take a break. I see. People must see their need. We would have more cases of Jesus helping if people were ready. In other words, I think Jesus is really, I really believe Jesus is ready to work. Uh, I, I was reading the other day and it said uh, G, uh, Jesus was in Nazareth, his hometown, and it said Jesus could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. And you know what I saw? I said, oh, Lord, this, you know, I'm, I'm funny. I went, oh, Lord, why'd you write that there? Why'd you allow that there? The devil's going to read that and go, hey, I know how to stop Jesus from doing anything. And anywhere, he can be the most mighty God in all, with all powers and abilities, 